name's Rory Spiegel. I'm an emergency medicine and critical care physician in Washington, D.C. And today we're going to talk about phenobarbital for alcohol withdrawal. And this is a how-to lecture getting into the, the nits and bits cl clinically on how to make this work operationally. So disclosures, financially, I have none. Intellectually, I'm incredibly biased on this topic and love phenobarb for alcohol withdrawal, but I promise you, you will be too when you start using it. So let's go briefly over the uh, physiology of alcohol withdrawal, and I promise we'll make this fairly quick. But essentially, you've got glutamate and GABA. Glutamate is one of your major excitatory neurotransmitters in your brain. GABA is one of your major inhibitory neurotransmitters in your brain. And most of the time when we're awake, these exist in some kind of balance, slight shifts either way, but the way we function in our conscious and alert is a balance of these two neurotransmitters. When you start drinking alcohol, which is a major neuro inhibitory neurotransmitter, you start to see far more inhibitory processes in your brain. That's why it causes sleepiness and lethargy and so forth. And so when someone is drinking constantly and have to actually start being functional, the body compensates this by decreasing the amount of receptors in the brain. That way they're able to balance this balance of excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters out again. The problem is if they stop drinking, you then create a state where you have far more excitatory neurotransmitters than inhibitories, and you get the state which is alcohol withdrawal, tachycardia, seizures, agitation, so on and so forth. And so to treat this, we use some kind of GABAergic agent, which again levels out these two areas. And so what we're going to talk about today is how we think about these GABAergic agents, how we select them, and why phenobarb is an optimal agent. So traditionally, we use benzodiazepines for alcohol withdrawal. Again, these are GABAergic agents. They work at the chloride receptor by augmenting the effects of GABA. And so GABA has to still be in the system for benzodiazepines to work, and they're essentially augmenting GABA to open the chloride channel longer. So typically, when we think of using benzodiazepines or any GABAergic agent to treat alcohol withdrawal, most of the data suggests we should be using a symptom-triggered approach versus a fixed dosing approach. And what this means is you're using the severity of the disease state that they're in to dose your medication. And what it's found is when you actually treat aggressively to get control of your symptoms up front, you end up using less agents, getting more control quicker and having less complications. Whereas if you're using a fixed dose protocol where I'm giving a certain amount of a drug, every few hours, you end up, one, getting behind, allowing the disease state, the alcohol withdrawal to get worse. And then on the backside, once you have got a control of it, stacking your doses too much on the back end, leading to more lethargy, lethargy and complications. And so treating to your symptoms or a symptom-based approach has been a, shown to be a far more effective strategy than a fixed dose approach. But what does that leave us with? When we think about our options from a benzodiazepine part, lorazepam is probably one of the biggest or most commonly used medications to treat alcohol withdrawal. And just pharmacokinetically, it has some downsides, meaning if I just take a simple graph here and I've got CSS levels on the y-axis and time on the x-axis and my red line in the middle there is therapeutic level. That's the level where I want to get to actually get control of my alcohol withdrawal. You have a number of problems with using out of and one you have to get multiple doses before you actually get an appropriate css level to get the patient under control and then the second unfortunate problem is the half-life really isn't that long usually before between four and eight hours and what is your levels drop below therapeutic over and over again so you constantly have to redose them with the medication and so what this lends up with is having a fairly complicated protocol which requires constant monitoring to make sure the patient isn't having worsening alcohol withdrawal, even if you have initially controlled them in the emergency department on presentation. This requires IU stay, lots of nursing involvement in the care of these patients, and it's just fairly work intensive. It can be used and you can get fairly good outcomes, but it's a lot of work to do so. And so there's better agents. Diazepam is a better agent, most notably because it has a fairly long half-life but it too requires a little bit of work up front, meaning the exact dose that's going to actually work for the each patient is somewhat unknown. And so you get this dose titration 
early on when you're managing the patient where you're stacking your doses and then doubling them 10, 10, 20, 20, 40, 40, 80, 80, so on and so forth until you get the alcohol withdrawal under control. The second problem with it is it has what's called an alpha and a beta half-life. It's very fat soluble. So you'll see this is an initial peak CS level that sometimes gets over your therapeutic level, but then it, as it redistributes through the fat, you get a second level, which is your long half-life level. So you have to get this beta half-life or this long half-life over their therapeutic level. Once that you achieve that, you actually have pretty good control because the half-life of diazepam is so long, it just takes a little work up front to get them where you want to be. And so again, there is some work when you're using this and you have protocols like this where you're just escalating your doses. You really need an experienced clinician treating these patients up front with this medication. So what if there was a drug that you would usually get appropriate therapeutic levels in one bolus with very little complications and have a very large half-life that you could just have a built-in taper and so you never have to redose them or you never acquire any more monitoring because once you have the patient therapeutic, they will stay therapeutic throughout their alcohol withdrawal. And so what I'm going to offer you today is phenobarb is probably that drug. And so why? What is special about phenobarb? And so the first thing is, what's the right dose for alcohol withdrawal on any given patient when you're using benzodiazepine? And the answer is, for anyone who's used them, you don't know, right? And that's why you dose stack. That's why you're giving 10 of diazepine, 10 of diazepine, 20, 20, 40, 40, and you keep escalating till you get them under control. But to get the predictable level is fairly hard. This is, can be said the same for lorazepam. On the other hand, phenobarb is very predictable. It's predictable in two ways. It's predictable what blood level will actually treat alcohol withdrawal. If you get a patient between 10 and 25 micrograms per milliliter of phenobarb serum phenobarb levels, usually their alcohol withdrawal will be under control. The second thing is to achieve those blood levels fairly reliable, meaning if you give a patient between 10 and 20 milligrams per kilogram, you basically end up with an appropriate blood level. And so it's a fairly easy medication to give, which has fairly predictable results. And so often you can give one dose, get the patient under control, use its long half-life to have a built-in taper. The second advantage of it, it has a wide therapeutic effect, meaning I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be 10. I don't have to be 20. I just have to be somewhere in between those levels, and usually I'll have an effect. And so I don't have to be as careful with my titration to see effect. I can give a fairly large dose and know that as long as I get it within this wide range, I typically will have the response I want. And the third and one of the most important things is it's actual toxic thresholds or the air, the levels of which harm are far below or far above, excuse me, any of the levels we're using when we're treating for alcohol withdrawal. If you look at this slide here, like we said, the therapeutic levels we typically shoot for with phenobarbers between 10 and 20 micrograms per milliliter. The levels where you even start to see signs of toxicity are much higher than that, 50 micrograms per milliliter. So you're using really safe doses. In fact, these are the doses when people used to be traded with phenobarb for seizures, as an outpatient, they would walk around with these doses, right? And so what you get is a drug, and you can be fairly heavy-handed in your first dose, knowing you're going to get the blood levels you want, but also knowing that the actual toxic thresholds or the thresholds for harm are far above the region you're playing in. And so this is what we get, right? We get a drug that has, you can give a single dose, get above your therapeutic level, and you can get a long built-in taper. That's the biggest advantage of phenobarb. Much like diazepam, it has a very long half-life. And so once you get someone therapeutic, they're going to stay therapeutic for days, meaning you're going to have a built-in taper and you won't have to redose them. And what this allows you to do is you no longer have to check CWAS. You no longer need nurses to watch these patients and have hourly or two-hourly monitoring of their alcohol withdrawal, and no, they no longer require ICUs because once you get them under control, they're safe to be monitored on the floor. So the evidence for this is not the best. We have multiple retrospective studies showing that phenobar works at least as well as other diazepam protocols with less workload for nursing. You have less ICU stays, less intubations, 
less need for rescue medication, just based on the, the pharmacokinetic principles we've talked about. The best data we probably have is a randomized controlled trial published in the Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2012. And essentially, it randomized about 50 patients in each group and showed that if you use phenobarb, you have a decrease in your need for ICU stay, which again makes sense because you no longer have to have complex seawall monitoring processes that require high levels of nursing care to manage these patients. All right. So that's why we should do it. Just a few brief considerations to think about logistically when you're implementing a phenobar protocol. The first one is there's this debate of symptom trigger versus fixed dose. And I think a phenobar protocol often gets mistaken as a fixed dose. And that's because most of the time, a single dose gets you where you need to be. But it's important to note, it is still a symptom triggered strategy. You're giving them a dose of a medication to treat their symptoms. Most of the time, a single dose will do, but every once in a while in fairly sick and fairly severe alcohol withdrawal, you're going to have to get a, give a second and sometimes even a third dose. That's very rare, but it's possible. So I want you to keep in mind, this is still a symptom-triggered strategy. It's just one that often one dose is all you need. The second thing to think about, this is not a magic pill, right? It's very effective for treating alcohol withdrawal but it doesn't treat other disease processes that you mistake as alcohol withdrawal. And more importantly, it doesn't treat the reason why the patient got into alcohol withdrawal in the first place. So if they have pancreatitis, alcohol, ketoacidosis, or some other disease process that caused them to start drinking, while the phenobar will treat the alcohol withdrawal, you still have to be diligent about treating the other medical processes that are going on. And finally, when you're implementing this, you start to realize that the doses you're using, which we'll go over in a sec, are fairly high and often have to be mixed up with pharmacy. And so having processes that allow you to have some phenobarb doses in the emergency department so you can start the treatment while the larger bolus or loading dose is being made in your pharmacy is fairly helpful. And so this is a protocol that we developed at our shop where essentially you've identified someone with alcohol withdrawal and you give them 130 milligram IV bolus, which we store in our Pixis in the emergency department. And then you look at their risk. And essentially, you're looking at, have they received a large amount of benzodiazepines already? Or do they have severe liver disease? And those two things, sometimes you can get in trouble with high doses of phenobarb. So you just start your load a little more carefully. And so if you either have already been loaded with lots of benzodiazepines, and we just said 12 milligrams of lorazepam equivalents or more, or you have known liver disease, we start our load at six. Otherwise, we start at 10 milligrams per kilogram of ideal body weight over on top of the 130 milligrams you've already given. And like I said, the important thing is to reevaluate at 30 minutes because if they still have symptoms of alcohol withdrawal, you can give an additional dose of three milligrams per kilogram times two. And so this will put you somewhere between your 10 and 20 milligrams per kilogram, which like we said earlier, in most patients will get you the response that you want. All right, so that wraps up this. Hopefully you found this really interesting. I really like when you start using phenobarb to treat alcohol withdrawal, you really see how complicated what you were doing before was and how much simpler this approach is. And it really changes your practice, I think, for the better.